Go ahead and get rolling. Amen. And uh, so we've had a great time with Ian Carroll. Amen. And um, I was excited that he wore his pink pants yesterday. I even hashtagged the picture apostolic pants. Right. And uh, so praise God. The sign of an apostle maybe is that you wear unusual britches. I don't know. So, but we're really thankful for what God has imparted and released over the last couple of days. Uh, many of you know Joe Moody, and Joe recommended that I connect with Ian, and I reached out to him, and we just had been dialoguing a little bit. I read one of his books, um, whose name I can't remember on the fivefold, Equipped for Glory. Is that it? Wow, I remembered. Um, really liked it. I really recommend that and the other materials they have, and uh, I just think... Um, Ian has uh, something um, even further for us today. I think the last two days have been really powerful, uh, but I just think today is strategic, and so no pressure for him. He doesn't feel it, Um, but let's just welcome him uh, as he comes and ministers today, and just welcome him and receive from what the Lord's going to do. Amen. Thank you, sir. So all the prophetic people, it's 11, 11, so, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, if you haven't heard me over the last couple of days, just to be clear, um, I say this a lot. I do not have an accent. I speak the Queen's English. I don't know what you speak, but you all have an accent, all right? So I, I kind of try to be understood, so sometimes I fake an American accent. It's generally a southern accent. When people fake American accents, it's generally southern. I think it's years of listening to Elvis, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so these, I do have some product at the back, and I'm the world's worst person at sort of plugging the product. But um, This is the book on the fivefold. So uh, it's not... I'd like to give this away to anyone who has a shameful addiction. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) Anyone? (laughs) Um, And and the other one is is my wife. This this literally is just out. Um, It's the voice of love, which is a basic uh, introduction to the prophetic. Um, my wife is a, is a prophet, and she does this course. She does uh, an e-course as well, which is, this book is based on, and the USBs are back there. So if you're interested in any of them, please go buy them. And if not, don't buy them. It's that simple. Um, is it anybody's birthday this week? Come get them. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about me because I think that's how the Apostle Paul does it a little bit as well. So, um, you know, he introduces himself and tells a little bit about who he is and all that. So, my wife and I are from Belfast in Northern Ireland. And we moved to the United States in 2001 because God called us to be missionaries to save your pagan souls. And um, so, yeah, we, we're, we've been here almost 19 years. Uh, I was the youth pastor in a, in a church, uh, a vineyard church. And then I became the executive pastor, and then I became the senior pastor. And almost three years ago, we stepped down as the senior pastors of the church because we had an encounter with a guy called Blaine Cook, and he kind of wrecked us and said it's time to do whatever is really on your heart to do. So we handed the church over to our spiritual son and daughter, uh, to one of our spiritual sons and daughters, and they're still leading the church, and we're still at the church. So I've been at the same church for 19 years, which I realize the more I travel is a bit of an anomaly in in the United States. Uh, So... Um, we lead a ministry called Building Contenders. Uh, you, can f- you can go to buildingcontenders.com if you want to find out more about it. Uh, you can look us up on Facebook. Just search for Building Contenders, and we'll appear. And, yeah, so that's kind of who we are. I spent 16 years in the police force. Uh, it was not a police service. It was a police force. 
uh, in Northern Ireland during the height of the conflict. Um, I like guns, I like knives, um, and I love golf. I love golf. So it's great to travel and have TVs with the golf channel on it. So I don't have cable at home, so it's great to be able to watch the golf. And poor Rory McIlroy didn't do that well this weekend, but anyway. We'll live. So part of part of the the stuff that's in my bones is I was at a church last weekend and, and the security guys, it's a pretty big church, and the security team said, My goodness, you're a you're a pastor and you're an alpha. Meaning that I'm I like guns and knives and I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bloke, I'm a guy. And uh, I I think that that I, I don't think I'm very macho, just to be clear, but I think what I, what I impart to people is this notion of contending. That's why we call ourselves building contenders. This notion of contending for stuff that's on your life, that this doesn't just drop into your lap, right? When you think of Abraham and, and Sarah, and I'll try to keep this PG-13, um, Abraham and Sarah have got a prophetic word from the Lord from the very mouth of God himself that you're going to be the father of many nations. And Abraham, Abram changes his name to Abraham. And, and I, I sort of think a little bit like, what does that look like? Hi, I'm the father of many nations. Oh, really? How many nations do you have? Well, none. Because his name actually means then the father of nations. Changing it means, is, you know, Abraham means the father of nations. So, hi, I'm the father of nations. Oh, that's incredible. How many nations? None. Well, how many children do you have? None. But I have this prophetic word. God has spoken to me about this prophetic word that I'm going to have children. So you understand that, that it wasn't an immaculate conception. All right? Now just stop your thinking right there. They had to actually do something to birth the prophetic word. Again, just don't go any further in your thought process than that, all right? But they had to do, as, as a hundred-year-old couple, they had to do something in order to conceive a child. And, and most of us are, are, you know, the more we travel, the more we see that people have got these prophetic words and they're, they're expecting God to make it happen. And that's not the purpose of prophecy is to, to expect God to make it happen. We have agency in this. In fact, we are the primary agency of of getting our prophetic words to happen, getting the destinies and call that's on our life to happen. But that means we have to, like, contend. That, that, that means we have to maybe even fight a little bit to, 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 for what God has spoken over my life. I have to fight for that because I'm, I'm actually told that, that we're in a war and we're using real bullets. That's what it feels like, right? We're in a war firm, and, and, and the enemy is actually using real bullets on us. Like, we're taking hits. And, and I actually think that part of the role of the fivefold is to, uh, particularly the apostle role, is to stop us taking hits. Is to stand up and say, hey, you've taken enough hits. This, this is illegal. This needs to stop. So, so you know, I, I want to read from Ephesians 6. No, I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the Passion Translation. I sort of mix it between the Passion and the New American, um, depending on whether I want to be fluffy or not. Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. And this is the passion. This is part, part of why I love it. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Isn't that great? Supernaturally infused. Stand victorious. Say victorious. With the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. The evil strategies of the accuser. You, you kind of think that, you know, when people bring an accusation against you or the church or, or whatever, that you're a bunch of nut jobs and you're all, woo, and you're surprised. Why are you surprised? He's the accuser. That's his job. 
right? We can't get all offended and, and hurt because he's accusing us. It's what he does, right? You have to develop that thick skin and a tender heart. You have to develop this sort of thick skin, this armor thing, because the enemy's going to come and accuse you of all sorts of stuff. You're not enough. <coughs> you're not enough. You're not, you're not as good as Bill Johnson. You're not, you're no Heidi Baker. What do you, who do you think you are? He's accusing you, right? You're not enough. You don't have this, you don't have that, you don't have the other. You don't have a great Irish accent. You'll never, right? He's, he's going to come at you with whatever. You failed in the past, and everybody's going to know your failure. He is the accuser. Do you know what accusation is? Spoken word. It's spoken words. There is power in a spoken word. It's why prophecy has to be spoken. I don't come and lay hands on someone and think a prophecy over them. I come and speak over them. It's why I think we should actually speak our prayers more. Well, maybe the devil will hear them. I don't give a monkey. It's like, I, you know, I'll speak my prayers. Not all the time, because, you know, but the great thing about Bluetooth headsets is that you can pray out loud and people don't think you're psychotic. <laughs> they just think you're on a phone call. Yeah, when someone was walking down the street years ago and they were talking to themselves, you thought, oh dear, stand away from them. But now you just think they're on the phone. So. Your hand to hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Now you understand, Paul is writing this after Jesus said, it's finished. Right? The, the victory is secure. And then Paul's telling people, hey, they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides so you're protected as you confront the slanderer. Well, you know, you know I'm not waging any warfare going to do all that. No, you're, you're supposed to confront the slander. What slander? Spoken words. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. Put on truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. You know there's a difference between standing and standing in triumph. Right? There's a, there's a certain swagger that comes with standing in triumph. There's a certain attitude that you have when you're standing in triumph. Like, this isn't being cocky. This is just standing in Christ's triumph. Put on truth as a belt and you'll, uh, to strengthen you to stand in triumph. Truth. Truth helps you to, to stand in triumph. What's the truth? I am a blood-bought child of the Most High God, and no weapon that's formed against me will prosper. That's truth. That's standing and declaring truth. Like, I know the enemy has come in like a flood. Like, I, I do believe that there, is, there has been a, you know, a, a what's the best way to put this? Um, that there has been um, an assignment of witchcraft that is around all the churches here in this region. Right? It's witchcraft. It's manipulation and control. It's rebellion. Right? That's what witchcraft is. It's not spells and all that. Witchcraft is manipulation, control, and rebellion. And, and that means we have to stand in truth. We have to stand in this place of triumph and, and truth. That's what the belt is for. Put on holiness as the protective armor that covers your heart. You know, the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I, it's the only time I ever use the phrase Holy Ghost. 
right? Because they're just like it. So it's very Pentecostal or something. I don't know. <laughs> but but it's righteousness, right? This holiness thing. It's not my it's not my holiness. Thank God it's not my holiness. Like it has to be his righteousness. It has to be his holiness that we're that we're putting on to protect our heart. Stand on your feet alert. There's that stand thing again. Then you'll always be ready to share the blessings of peace. In every battle, take faith, faith, as your wraparound shield, for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance, like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. And take the mighty razor sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. The spoken word of God. Of God. Not the thought word of God, not the read word of God, the spoken word of God. <clears throat> you know the you know the, the sword of the spirit thing? It's fascinating. I find it fascinating. Because it's a short sword. Remember I said I like knives and guns. Swords are great, but this is a short sword. And the purpose of the Roman army to have a short sword wasn't just to get into hand-to-hand -hand close combat. It was so that if an arrow went into them, they could actually get it in, get it out. So this sword, when, when the enemy has pierced you, your weapon is the spoken word of God. The rhema. I'm in Oklahoma, so I can say that. Right? It is the spoken word of God, whether it's scripture or your prophetic word or something that God has dropped in your heart. When the enemy comes in and the enemy is having a field day, then you need to stand in triumph, stand in his righteousness, and start declaring some truths. Start actually speaking some truths. It's about your posture and it's about your speech. Like we can't stand, oh my goodness. Oh, if it's the Lord's will. You know, that's Islam. That's not Christiana, Christianity. You know, if, if, if God wills it, no. We have this running joke in our family. My son's a theology student, and we have this running joke that every time he texts us about something, he'll say, God, you know, if God wills it, DV, if God wills it. And it's a joke because, you know, that's not Christianity. Christianity is we are actually taking things captive. We're on an offensive. You know the scripture that says, now, you know, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, first of all, I don't think that stops us from building the church, right? Because Jesus isn't actually here physically building this church, right? So that doesn't stop us from, from building the church. And the gates of hell, and I know that it was a very specific place, and that place was this place of, of sacrificing to, to a different God. And they would throw their children off a cliff, and they would land in this cave. And they would do all sorts of horrible things around it. And, and where, the, where the sacrifice landed was called the gates of hell. And Jesus is doing this object lesson with his youth group at the gates of hell. And so I know that it's that. But if you use the metaphor even, has anyone ever been chased down the street by a pair of gates? Like, I mean, do, do you see that happen a lot? You know, I'm walking down the street, and oh my goodness, there's a couple of gates running after me here. Right, the metaphor isn't that, that the enemy is chasing us. The, the metaphor is that we're actually on full-on frontal attack and assault on the enemy's camp. That's our, that's our mandate. Our mandate is to get the hell out of whatever region we're in, right? That's our mandate. Like, that's what we're called to do. And we're not going to do that if we're always taking a back foot and, you know, worrying about what the enemy's doing. The enemy's worried about what you're doing. Like, the enemy is absolutely terrified of you walking in the fullness of your destiny. You, you know that. The enemy is terrified of this place becoming a strategic healing center. He's terrified of it. 
He is terrified, and he'll try to do every lie and accusation and slander to stop it from happening. He is, listen, he is terrified. Every healing that happens is a slap in his face. Every victory that's won in someone's life, every time a, a marriage is restored, every time a family is restored, every time your destiny is restored, is a kick in the hiney for the enemy. That's what we're called to do. We're supposed to be contending and fighting for something, not just sitting back, not sitting on our blessed assurances, waiting on the rapture so that everything will be better. Take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. I, I don't know if you know this, but this is, this is the, the scripture I'm going to read is not terribly popular. This, this one here is not, you know, I don't wake up every morning and say, I'm going to read Philippians 1 because it's awesome. I, I don't do that. I'm, and, and this is why. Whatever happens, keep li- this is Philippians 1.27, and again, it's the passion. Whatever happens, keep living your lives based on the reality of the gospel of Christ, which reveals him to others. Then when I come to see you or hear good reports of you, I'll know that you stand united in one spirit and one passion. Celebrating together as conquerors in the faith of the gospel, faith of the gospel. All right, so... When I come to see you or hear good reports of you, I'll know that you stand united in one spirit and one passion, celebrating together as conquerors in the faith of the gospel. Celebrating together. And then you will never, say never, then you will never be shaken or intimidated by the opposition that rises up against us. For your courage will only prove as a sure sign from God of their coming destruction and that you have found a new life. The fact that you're given good reports, the fact that you're standing as conquerors, the fact that you're standing united together means that you will never be shaken or intimidated by the opposition that rises up against you. Never intimidated or shaken. For God has graciously given you the privilege not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him. I don't like that bit. Like, do you ever wake up and go, Jesus, thank you for the privilege of suffering for you. Hope to get a bit more suffering today. Because it's a real privilege to suffer for Jesus. Like, just to be clear, it's suffering for Jesus, not because of your political beliefs, right? It's suffering for Jesus, not because of your, um, let's be honest, stupidity at times, right? It's suffering for Jesus, not because you've made silly decisions, bad decisions, or you don't know how to do relationships. It's suffering for Jesus that is a, that is a privilege. For you have been called by him to endure the conflict in the same way I have endured it. For you know I'm not giving up. It says in another translation, for you know I'm not quitting. This is the very essence of an apostolic people, is that you don't quit. Suffering comes, I'm not quitting. Then the enemy wins. I'm not back and dying. I know what I'm called to do. Is it hard at times? Absolutely. Are we promised that there will be troubles? In this world, you will have trials, tribulation, troubles, whatever way you want to interpret that. But in this world, you're going to get it. It's a promise. This is not some happy, clappy, I'm just going to be a Pollyanna thing. This is, there are things that are coming against you. There are things that are, you know, the fact that it says, no weapons formed against you shall prosper, doesn't mean there are no weapons. And it doesn't mean you're not going to be hit with the weapons. It just means they're not going to prosper. 
right? That's our stand. So trouble comes, and you should see it as an indication that you're doing something right. <coughs> but Jesus said, but, but don't, don't, you know, don't be disheartened. Don't be in despair, because I have overcome the world. You know, there's a, there's a myth. There's a myth that preachers do, and that's that, you know, hey, we're conquerors. In fact, I could read it out. I could read, read, read it out from Romans 8, you know, that, hey, don't forget, you're conquerors. In fact, Paul, I read it out there that you're, that, you know, celebrating together as conquerors in the faith of the, of the gospel. You know, hey, we're, that's, that's not really the full truth. We're actually called more than conquerors. Now, that's the truth. That's, that's the spoken word of God. I'm just quoting scripture to you. That in all these things, you know what, if, let, let me read it out from Romans 8. <coughs> I could read all of Romans 8 out actually because it's awesome. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Like, who's going to do it? Well, you know there is someone's going to do it. So it's not saying that there's nobody's going to do it. No, no, someone's going to do it. That's, that's the enemy's job. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one that condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation? Will it? What do you, what do you say? What, what would you say with a bit of swagger in your, in your, you know, what would you say if you're standing in triumph? Will tribulation separate you from the love of Christ? Hell, No. Literally, hell, no. Right? What about distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Perils? No. Or, or a sword? No. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know that principalities is in there? Principalities are interesting. So, I'm a mystical guy. Do you, do you all know what demons are? They're not fallen angels, right? That's, that's what they're not. They're absolutely not fallen angels. Do you know what principalities are? Not so much, right? Because we don't, we don't actually get, get a lot of teaching on it. Um, and because we're not really fully, you know, just nobody teaches in this. Let's talk about it. You know there are good principalities and bad principalities? And there are things called rulers and powers that, that they're all these sort of like heavenly beings. But let me ask you a question. Do, do, do we believe in one God? Do you think there are other gods? Trick question, right? You're, no, I'm not answering. I'm not answering. Uh, you're going to tell me I'm wrong? I don't, I don't know. So when, when God says you shall have no other gods before me, you understand that he wasn't talking about your chocolate obsession. Right? I've really made a God of Netflix. I put Netflix before God. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about other gods, like Baal. Whole, whole host of them in the Old Testament. I think it's fascinating. I, one of my favorite things is, is when Aaron is confronted by Moses about the calf that they're making. And, you know, this golden calf. And... It's interesting that a people who don't know how to handle money just waste it. They don't know how to handle wealth, the wealth of Egypt, and they just waste it. So they put it all in, and Aaron says, you know, 
Moses, you'll never believe what happened. We melted the gold, and this calf that just came up. <laughs> no, it didn't, right? Because Moses is there, and God says, you better get down there because they're getting in trouble. They're going to get themselves in trouble. <coughs> so there are other gods, small g, if you will, if you will. Some of those rebel, and they are the principality. They're the actual ones that have power and authority given by God, and then God stripped them all off it. So God stripped the enemy of all power and authority on the cross. If you read Colossians chapter 2, uh, the, Eugene Peterson says it really well. You know, he says he stripped the enemy from all his authority and dragged him or dragged him naked through the streets. I love it. Just to, to, and that's what they used to do when they conquered a, 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 a region. They used to strip the king and parade him, you know, through the streets naked to just show that he was completely conquered. So, so the, the devil has no power. The principalities have no power unless we give it to them. That, that's the only way they're empowered. So... If you ever do deliverance ministry, what's one of the first things you have to do in deliverance ministry is you have, you know, deliverance ministry should be really easy because God, God, Jesus himself promised that he would deliver us from our enemies, not our friends, right? So the first thing you need to do is make this demon thing your enemy. You need to repent. You need to change your mind because it's empowered by you. It gets its power from you. It doesn't get it from non-Christians. It gets, they get their power from Christians. So if the, if the devil is an accuser and a slanderer, where does he get his power from? Christians who are accusing and slandering. They are fueling a different kingdom. Principalities get their power from Christians cooperating with the principalities. Well, you know, this is a really, really hard region for the gospel. You've just empowered the enemy. You've just given him power that he does not have, should not have. That church down there, they're, they're the frozen chosen. Right? They're dead in Christ. <laughs> right? There's no life. You're empowering a principality. Your spoken word is the one of the most powerful things on the planet because you can empower a different kingdom by your spoken word. It's life and death are in the power. You have the capacity to create life or death by using your spoken word. So what are we doing? We're demolishing strongholds, 2 Corinthians. I might read it in two versions. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. And since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion. Remember, it's not against flesh and blood, right? Um, but we're, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. Let me read it from the New American. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. This is talking about stronghold fortresses in cities and regions. This is how we do it. This isn't just your personal mission and call. This is... This is stuff that is destroying regions, right? 
where the enemy is coming in and the Christians all support it. Support him. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So this, this spiritual warfare stuff isn't going out and, you know, rebuking the whatever. That, that's not the spiritual warfare that destroys fortresses. The spiritual warfare that destroys fortresses is right here. Right here. We're bringing every thought into captivity. So the enemy comes in with a little whisper, you're not good enough. Well, he has made me good enough. I am, I am, I am not worthless. Right? I am not worthless. I am worth something. Like, you know you're worth something. I have, a, I have an iPhone, I don't know what it is, 10. So I'm willing to sell this. And there's some pretty interesting phone numbers in this if you want to take a quick look at it. And, um, some powerful people. And would anyone like to give me $10,000 for this iPhone? Anyone? See, the, the price isn't determined by the seller, right? The, the price is determined by the person who buys it. Think about it. How much are you worth? You're worth Jesus. You're worth Jesus, you know, leaving all of heaven. You're worth him laying aside absolutely everything all of heaven to come and buy you. So when the enemy comes in and said, you're nothing, who do you think you are? I love a line from Tolkien's um, The Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, and, and Gandalf comes in and he's confronted. He comes in to see Theoden, who's my, I love Tolkien, just so you know, let you in, see a little bit about it. Love Tolkien. And my favorite character in the in the Tokyo in the Lord of the Rings is Theoden, the king of Rohan. <coughs> and he's this old guy, if you've watched the movie, he's wizened and old. And he has this guy whispering in his ear the whole time, negative thoughts, worm tongue. And Gandalf comes in and you know, worm tongue stands up to Gandalf. And Gandalf says, I will not bandy words with a witless worm. What about that for a declaration? Like when the enemy's coming in, I will not bandy words with a witless worm. Right? Not, not people, but the spirit behind it. I'm actually not going to engage in this fight. The worst thing you can do even as a body, as you're building, right? Nehemiah had to build something. Nehemiah had to restore something. And there he is in the middle of, of this restoration project. And, and building wasn't enough. He had to both build and battle, right? They, they had a, a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. That this wasn't just a time for building. This is a time for building and battling. But make sure you're choosing the right enemy because people aren't, are not the enemy unless they are at times. But, you know, sometimes they have to be stopped and removed from the church and all that. That's totally, you know, wolves appear in sheep's clothing. So that's what they do. But here's Nehemiah building. And, and you know, you have San Ballot who's coming with a, a couple of his cronies, and they're saying, hey, why don't you come down here and we'll chat about what you're doing? And Nehemiah says, I will not bandy words with a witless worm. Right? He said, I am not coming down to your level. I am not coming down to where you're at. I know what I'm called to do, and I'm going to build this thing here. And any discussion, I mean, the, the discussion is pointless. It's not going to bring unity. That's, that's not what brings unity. What brings unity is the fivefold. It's in Ephesians 4. That's the only thing that's going to bring unity. It's not, well, let's, you know, make sure everybody's feelings aren't hurt. No, I know what I'm called to do, and I am not coming down to your level. In Jesus' name. 
and in love. I'm not hitting you. I'm just not stopping building. Because this is a season, I believe, for this church to build and to battle. You're supposed to be building, building, building. That's one of the marks of apostles is that we want to build. Please make, help me build something. Build, build, build. But there's also this other side of an apostle where you're built. We are built for war. Apostles are actually built for a good fight. So you've got this, like I believe that Nehemiah is leading his, his people in, an, in what would later become an apostolic movement because they're building and they're battling at the same time. They're not just doing one. They're not taking a little break. There's this, this kind of myth in the church that, you know, we need a Sabbath rest. You know, God wasn't tired, right? Like, he wasn't, oh, that's been six days. Oh, I need a break. That's not the purpose. The purpose is actually to enjoy what you've been building, right? The purpose is to enjoy this. Hey, I'm going to take a look back and, oh, that's great. And you know that not everything in the garden was good, right? It wasn't good that man was alone. That wasn't good. And, and when he created mankind, he didn't say that we were good. He said we we're pretty awesome. He said we we're very good. We're the only things in all creation that are very good. Very good. Right? When you look at the mountains and the stars, you're going, wow, they're amazing. And God's going, you're very good, though. Like, they're good, but you're very good. So this is the battle. The battle is to take our thoughts into captivity. Like, like prisoners of war, you're not escaping. I'm going to bring you into captivity. So it's what you think and what you speak will actually destroy principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, and heavenly places. What you think and what you speak. So you've got to really be careful what you're speaking. Because like, when you're walking the streets and you think, oh my goodness, this is desolate, which kingdom are you empowering? You know, Jesus even required fruitfulness out of season. That's the kingdom. It's supposed to be fruitful. How is it going to be fruitful if you're just going to speak death? It's not. You've got to speak life. You're like, bless this streets. Bless these streets. Bless this land. Like, I bless this land with abundance. That should be your prayer walking. That should be what you're doing. There's a church that are antagonistic towards you. God, I bless them. God, that you would move in such a mighty way with them. Like, that you would move in such a mighty way that they that they can't contain the number of people that are going to get saved, healed, and set free. Like, move in that way. Because you know, you know the real test of a person's heart is through promotion, not through adversity. And people get to adjust through promotion, not through adversity. Adversity just makes you, you know, shield yourself and continue to be a little orphan. Whereas if we're starting to pray for promotion, right? Like a rising tide raises all ships. If we want the Spirit of God to move. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Bethel guy. And, you know, Bethel has had this enormous explosion. And you know one of the really healthy things that's happened is all of the other churches have grown. Like, that's incredible. Other churches have been planted. There was one church that was planted, and within six months, there's like 400 people. Because it's healthy, Right? And when something's healthy, it expands, and the health expands. And, you know, you want this to be a cancer-free area? Start thinking and speaking. As a man thinks, so he is. This isn't some, like, weird New Age thing. This isn't some Tony Robbins thing. This is, this is Scripture. You, you know that your life will always move in the direction of your dominant thinking. Like, your dominant thinking. If your dominant thinking is destruction, your life will move in that. So, you know, you know in Scripture where it talks about people having a spirit of infirmity? There's a couple of times where people have a spirit of infirmity. One woman who'd had it for 38 years or something like that. The word spirit is pneuma. And sometimes it's a spirit. Most of the time, it's a mindset. 
Like most of the time, this spirit of infirmity is a mindset saying, I'm worth nothing. I'm, 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 I'm worth nothing. I'm, I'm useless. I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. And what happens is because of these declarations, your body starts to react to what's been spoken over it. Your whole being comes into alignment with what you really believe. That's why I think Paul is saying, hey, you know what? There's going to be troubles, but you're victorious. You're a hyper-conqueror. You're a hyper-conqueror. You're not just a conqueror. You're a hyper-conqueror. That's what we're supposed to do. This, isn't gr- some, this doesn't make a great weekend conference of you know spiritual warfare and deliverance because I can give it to you in 10 minutes. Watch what you think. Watch what you speak. You want something to be blessed? Bless it. You want you want your marriage to be blessed? Bless it. You want yourself to be blessed? Bless yourself. Bless my soul. Right? Bless my soul. Lord, bless my body. Bless my checkbook. Bless my relationships. Bless my marriage. Bless my kids. Stop pointing out the flaws. Now, if you're a prophetic person, you like pointing out the flaws. That's why they need apostles. I'm, I'm, I'm in a house full of prophetic people. And we have this joke again that, you know, okay, something went wrong. We just need to know who to blame. If, if we can just find out who was wrong, then we'll be fine. And we're not going to try and fix it. We just need to know that you were the, you were the one that did it the mark of prophetic people. You know, prophets have, prophets have this sword. Right? The, 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 the power of a prophet is through the sword. It's through this word, the word of God, the spoken word of God. Thus saith the Lord. The problem is they need to put the sword away the odd time. You know? They just need to put the sword away and just be nice. Can you just, just be nice? <laughs> this isn't about finding out who's at fault. You'll, you'll, be on, you'll be on this rabbit trail of like researching the history and destiny and all that of the region. You don't need to do that. You just need to say, what's God spoken? What has God said? What, what has God said? What is this spoken word of God that God has had over this house? We were even meeting last night with, with these guys and just saying, hey, let's dig out the prophecies. Let's dig them out. And let's not just have them in a, in a journal somewhere or in a recording somewhere. Let's start to speak them out. Let's start to declare that this is an epicenter of healing and revival. Let's do that. Like, this is the welcome, right? Hey, welcome to our church. We are an epicenter of healing and revival in this region. Right? Let's declare that so that people know, okay. Like, you under, you all felt that, right? I speak it, you feel it. That's what it's for. And all of hell currently is going, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Like, you understand the minute you get a prophetic word, it has to be tested. Like, it has to be tested. It's not, it's not, it's not optional, right? There has to be a test. Jesus is, you know, Jesus comes out of the wilderness. He does his inaugural address. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Right? And what, what what else? It's like to release the captives. And then later on, John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus and says, John wants to know, are you really the one? Or should we be looking for somebody else? Jesus gives the prophetic word, I am going to release the captives, and John's in captivity. The experience was the complete opposite of what God had spoken. And Jesus said, tell John what you see. You know, the the lame walk, the blind see, the the deaf hear, and the gospel is preached to the poor. The good news is being told to the poor. Do you know what the good news to the poor is? You don't have to be poor. (coughs) Sorry, we'll we'll do that another time. so. So, So we have this, and Jesus then goes on to say, and blessed is he who is unoffended in me. 
So you get a prophetic word, there must be opposition. The minute you see the complete opposite happening, you know it's a, it's a word from God. Like, you know that it's a word from God. Like, the actual test of the prophecy is that it's been immediately, sometimes it's even the same day. You know, the same day, you're, you know, you get this amazing prophetic word that God is actually going to take you to the nations, and the next day you lose your passport. Or in my case, my wallet, because I don't know where it is at the minute. So, right? You, you, you get opposition. And it's how we respond to the opposition. What word are you believing? Are you believing the promise or are you believing the problem? We have to believe in the promise. Like that, that's where, you know, I heard a rumor that we're actually called believers, not unbelievers. Let me read from. Faith operated powerfully in Abraham, for when he was put to the test, he offered up Isaac. Even though he received God's promises of descendants, he was willing to offer up his only son for God had promised. Abraham's faith made it, to lo made it logical to him that God could raise Isaac from the dead. The power of faith prompted Isaac to impart a blessing to his sons. Jacob worshipped in faith's reality at the end of his life, and leaning upon his staff, he imparted a prophetic blessing on each of Joseph's sons. Faith inspired Joseph and opened his eyes to see into the future. For as he was dying, he prophesied about the exodus of Israel. And, and th this is Hebrews 11. And, and what more could I say to convince you? For there is not enough time to tell you of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Through faith's power, they conquered kingdoms conquered kingdoms and established true justice. Their faith fastened onto their promises and pulled them into reality. It was faith that shut the mouth of lions, put out the power of raging fire and caused many to escape certain death by the sword. In their weakness, their faith imparted, imparted power to make them strong. Faith sparked courage within them and they became mighty warriors in battle, pulling armies from another realm yeah, into battle array. Faith-filled women saw their dead children raised in resurrection power. These were the true heroes commended for their faith, yet they lived in hope without receiving the fullness of what was promised. You see, faith, living a life of faith and overcoming kingdoms isn't about receiving everything that you believed. It's about, it's about an attitude and a posture of our heart that says, I will die in faith rather than live in unbelief. I want to go to my grave believing that what God has spoken is true. And I know that even if I don't see it here in this life, that I will see it in the next life. Why don't you stand? I want, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. You're going you're to pray with me. I'm going, to, I'm going to say some stuff, just like these declarations that we did. I'm going to say some stuff, and you're going to repeat it back, okay? But here's the thing. You can't do it nicely. You know, like you're reading the declaration, checks in the mail. I'm sorry. I'm like, checks in the mail? Yes! <laughs> Checks in the mail. So I, I want you to stand. So I want you to stand in triumph. I want you to stand in triumph. I want you right now to have a posture. Like you might be too cool for school, but you're not too cool for this. I want you to stand with a posture of triumph, right? You're, you're about to go into some hand-to-hand -hand combat right now for you, your church, and your region. This is what we're going to do. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak these declarations out. You're going to repeat them, all right? And if you get mixed up or confused, don't worry about it. Just go, should have bought a Honda. Shaba, something like that. All right. My hand is upon the neck of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. 
I am anointed to preach, to teach, to heal, and to cast out devils. I receive abundance of grace. And I reign in life through Christ Jesus. I have life and more abundantly. I walk in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the head and not the tail. I shall decree a thing and it shall be established. We're not done. <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. I have favor with God and with man. Wealth and riches are in my house. I will be satisfied with long life. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. No evil will befall me. No plague shall come near my home. My children are taught of the Lord. And great is their peace. I am strengthened with might by his spirit. I am rooted and grounded in love. I bless my natural enemies. And I overcome evil with good. Amen. Amen. So you, you can take a seat. What hap you can take a seat. What happens in the spirit realm whenever you start to make decrees is that uh, the, the whole angelic start to vibrate. Like they start to vibrate and it looks like they get bigger. And when there are spirits of religion or any of those other horrible things, they diminish like, you know, you know back to the future where the photograph fades away? That's what it looks like with the demonic and the principality stuff when we start to make decrees. The, the angelic get emboldened by prophecy and declaration. And the enemy gets lesser and lesser. So, bless you guys. Thank you. Hallelujah. So, we have to love our city. Yeah. So, the next time that you want to criticize Ardmore, bless Ardmore. Bless this county. Bless this region. Amen. And um, it's, it's our call. And, you know, I was telling Ian years ago when we, we came here, when God sent us back from Japan, and then God had to start a church, and he just told us, he said, you can rewrite the history of your city. And we just to begin to declare it's a new day, Right? And um, we didn't always have the right declarations, right? But God's given us a love for our city and for this region. And if we want to see all the promises of God come forth, let's begin to declare what the Lord wants. Amen. And we just have to do that. And, uh, you know, excellent, excellent word. Um you know, we're going to take an offering in a minute for Ian. And you can go ahead and make preparations for that. You can make checks payable to Global Harvest Church, uh, give cash. Um, <clears throat> it's going to say something really profound, and it's gone. You know, but I, I really, I know in one of our most difficult moments as a church, um, I just stood up and preached out of Nehemiah and said, we're not coming off the wall. You know, we're not. We're not wasting our time to come off the wall and argue with people about what God's told us to do. You know, and we've just determined to live that way. 
you know, and I, I know we've had some legitimate words from the Lord, right? <laughs> and about, you know, a week after we got them, everything blew up, right? Or the words that we had and then the people we lost after those words. And you know what? I'm going to die in faith. I'm going to die in faith, but you know what? We're going to see the fulfillment. Our children will see the fulfillment, right? Our grandchildren will see the fulfillment, you know, of what God has said to us as a people, as a church, as a region. You know, too many people have had these words, and so all that word's been over this city for a long time. What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to run with it, right? And I'm not going to make excuses that this region is too hard or I don't like it here. That's a cop-out, right? I'm preaching to myself right now. Amen. So I think we should take an offering. I think we should take a good offering. Amen. And uh, let's just sow into Ian, right, into what he carries and and just bless him. Um, bless him out of this region. Amen. And uh, we're, we're, this little church, we're just known for blessing people. Amen. So let's just do that. Father, I want to thank you today. Father, we want to thank you for all your promises. God, we want to thank you for all the things that you've said and you've declared. Lord, we, we would be a refidim, a place where a nation is watered. Father, that you said that our economy in this place would even change because of the people that were coming to partake of what God was doing. Father, you said a healing revival, a radical healing revival. You said that we would launch people to the nations. You said that we were a house of revival and healing and deliverance and transformation, God. Father God, you said that we would go to the nations, and you said that the nations would come here to receive what God was doing. And so, Father, we believe every promise. Father, we thank you for even the testimonies of businessmen in the last year that have come and said, this neighborhood is different since you've come here. And Father, I thank you that that's just going to continue. It's going to increase. Father, you're just going to continue to pour out. Father, you're going to raise up out of this generation, out of this place, a generation of leaders, revivalists, and reformers. God, we thank you for that today. And Father God, we thank you that you've given us the privilege to build and to battle. And Father, we thank you today. I thank you for each one of these people, God, for the grit that's in their life. Father, the grit to stand and to believe and to war. And Father, I thank you where we're weak, you're making us strong. Thank you for your grace. Lord, we give today in faith and joy. We give in faith. Amen. Amen. Praise. That wasn't very good, but faith. Yeah, I tried, right? So, hallelujah. All right. So, let's just take up this offering. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. God's good. And we were dialoguing last night about how in the world we're going to build a new building. In faith, right? Right? Hallelujah. Amen. It's time for miracles. Amen. Praise God. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of these last days and what the Lord is doing. Um, and we just celebrate what he's doing. 
We do have teams. If you need a prophetic word, we'll have a prophetic team here where you can come and receive prophetic ministry. If you need prayer for physical healing, if there's still someone who needs prayer for kidneys, amen, you can come and get prayer and God will touch you and other conditions as well. So uh, bless you guys. Remember, no supernatural school tomorrow night. And um, bless you, and we will see you next week. Amen? Amen. God bless.